Hey, Carr here. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick moment and give you, uh, you know, just a quick acknowledgement here. First of all, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all of you who have subscribed to the channel. A uh, big shout out and thanks to all of my wonderful patron and all of my channel members who have helped make this project possible. I never would have thought last year I would have even had a quarter of the support that I have on the channel right now. Uh, as such, uh, I ran a poll not too long ago asking people what they thought I should do from a few given options of what of when I hit 5k subscribers. Uh, we have surpassed that now. Uh, at time of writing, I have over 5,100 actually. And so what was agreed upon was an hour long theory read. And so what's going to follow is honestly a little more than an hour read of some great black anarchist theory. Um, I encourage you to listen to it and enjoy it. Um, definitely makes a great background listen. I will also just uh, remind you that as with all theory that we engage with, it is a product of the time that it was made. We don't necessarily need to agree wholeheartedly with every sentence of a theoretical text written by uh, an activist or philosopher or an economist or what have you. It's the overall message and the goals that the theory inspires is what we want to take from it. So uh, I'm not going to talk any more about that. Without further ado, please uh, enjoy the reading and thank you again for subscribing and sharing the channel. I appreciate each and every one of you. Anarchism and the Black Revolution by Lorenzo Kambua Irvin Dedication for the second edition of Anarchism and the Black Revolution. I dedicate this second edition of Anarchism and the Black Revolution to comrade Ginger Katz, one of the founders of the original North American Anarchist Black Cross almost 15 years ago. It was Ginger Katz who almost single-handedly arranged for the typesetting, publishing, and printing of the first edition, and then she went out and sold them by the thousands. Without her, this second edition would not have been possible. She had to fight to get the books published, and to get a hearing for myself and other black anarchists who had things to say about the direction of the movement. The anarchist purists, who wanted to keep the movement all white and as an individualist countercultural phenomenon, fought her tooth and nail. Some of these criticisms and struggles were thinly veiled racism, and I am sure that they frustrated and exhausted Comrade Ginger. If so, she never relayed it to me, but I heard it from other sources. I remember my dealings with anarchists in the movement during the 1970s who denied the existence of racism as something we should fight entirely, but not Comrade Ginger. She was one of the few anarchists who understood how the American state was organized and how it used white skin privilege to split the working class and to continue the dictatorship of capitalism through such divide and rule tactics. I still have some of the letters that Ginger wrote to me 15 years ago when I was in prison but I lost contact with her since early 1980s. In 1983, I was released from prison and became estranged from the anarchist and prison movements, so I do not know where she is. But wherever she is, I hope she will know how much I appreciate what she did to make this project a reality, and how she laid the seeds for growth of the present and future libertarian socialist movement on this continent, and hopefully around the world. I am hopeful that one day I might meet her, and maybe when I am on a national book tour for this and other books I have written, and just thank her for helping me when I could not help myself. To this comrade, I will give my love and respect always. Thank you. Lorenzo Kambua Irvin, September 1993 Chapter 1 An Analysis of White Supremacy this pamphlet will briefly discuss the nature of anarchism and its relevance to the black liberation movement. Because there have been so many lies and distortions of what anarchism really stands for by both its left and right wing ideological opponents, it will be necessary to discuss the many popular myths about it. This in itself deserves a book but is not the intention of this pamphlet, which is merely to introduce the black movement to revolutionary anarchist ideals. It is up to the reader to determine whether these new ideas are valid and worthy of adoption. How the Capitalists Use Racism The fate of the white working class has always been bound with the condition of black workers. Going back as far as the American colonial period when black labor was first imported into America, black slaves and indentured servants have been oppressed right along with whites of the lower classes. 
but when European indentured servants joined with blacks to rebel against their lot in the late 1600s, the propertied class decided to free them by giving them a special status as whites, and thus a stake in the system of oppression. Material incentives, as well as the newly elevated social status, were used to ensure these lower class allegiance. This invention of the white race and racial slavery of the Africans went hand in glove, and is how the upper classes maintained order during the period of slavery. Even when poor whites had aspirations of doing better, since their social mobility was ensured by the new system, this social mobility, however, was on the backs of the African slaves, who were super-exploited. But the die had been cast for the dual-tier form of labor, which exploited the African, but also trapped white labor. When they sought to organize unions or for higher wages in the North or South, white laborers were slapped down by the rich, who used enslaved black labor as their primary mode of production. The so-called free labor of the white worker did not stand a chance. Although the capitalists used the system of white skin privilege to great effect to divide the working class, the truth is that the capitalists only favored white workers to use them against their own interests, not because there was true white class unity. The capitalists did not want white labor united with blacks against their rule and the system of exploitation of labor. The invention of the white race was a scam to facilitate this exploitation. White workers were bought off to allow their own wage slavery and the Africans' super-exploitation. They struck a deal with the devil, which has hampered all efforts at class unity for the last four centuries. The continual subjugation of the masses depends on competition and internal disunity. As long as discrimination exists and racial or ethnic minorities are oppressed, the entire working class is oppressed and weakened. This is so because the capitalist class is able to use racism to drive down the wages of individual segments of the working class by inciting racial antagonism and forcing a fight for jobs and services. This division is a development that ultimately undercuts the living standards of all workers. Moreover, by pitting whites against blacks and other oppressed nationalities, the capitalist class is able to prevent workers from uniting against their common class enemy. As long as workers are fighting each other, capitalist class rule is secure. If an effective resistance is to be mounted against the current racist offensive of the capitalist class, the utmost solidarity between workers of all races is essential. The way to defeat capitalist strategy is for white workers to defend the democratic rights won by blacks and other oppressed peoples after decades of hard struggle, and to fight to dismantle the system of white skin privilege. White workers should support and adopt the concrete demands of the black movement, and should work to abolish the white identity entirely. These white workers should strive for multicultural unity, and should work with black activists to build an anti-racist movement to challenge white supremacy. However, it is very important to recognize the right of the black movement to take an independent road in its own interests. This is what self-determination means. Race and Class, the Combined Character of Black Oppression Because of the way this nation was developed with the exploitation of African labor and the maintenance of an internal colony, blacks and other non-white peoples are oppressed both as members of the working class and as a racial nationality. As Africans, in America they are a distinct people, hounded and segregated in U.S. society. By struggling for their human and civil rights, they ultimately come into confrontation with the entire capitalist system, not just individual racist or regions of the country. The truth soon becomes apparent. Blacks cannot get their freedom under this system because, based on historically uneven competition, capitalist exploitation is inherently racist. At this juncture, the movement can go into the direction of revolutionary social change or limit itself to winning reforms and democratic rights within the structure of capitalism. The potential is there for either. In fact, the weakness of the 1960s civil rights movement was that it allied itself with the liberals in the Democratic Party and settled for civil rights protective legislation instead of pushing for social revolution. This self-policing by the leaders of the movement is an abject lesson about why the new movement has to be self-activated and not dependent on personalities and politicians. But if such a movement does become a social revolutionary movement, it must ultimately unite its forces with similar movements like gays, women, radical workers, and others who are in revolt against the system. 
For example, in the late 1960s, the Black Liberation Movement acted as a catalyst to spread revolutionary ideas and images, which brought forth the various opposition movements we see today. This is what we believe will happen again, although it's not enough to call for mindless unity, as much of the white left does. Because of the dual forms of oppression of non-white workers and the depth of social desperation it creates, black workers will strike first, whether their potential allies are available to do so or not. This is self-determination, and that is why it is necessary for oppressed workers to build independent movements to unite their own peoples first. This is why it is absolutely necessary for white workers to defend the democratic rights and gains of non-white workers. This self-activity of the oppressed masses, such as the black liberation movement, is inherently revolutionary and is an essential part of the social revolutionary process of the entire working class. These are not marginal issues. It cannot be downgraded or ignored by white workers if a revolutionary victory is to be had. It, it has to be recognized as a cardinal principle by all that oppressed peoples have a right to self-determination, including the right to run their own organizations and liberation struggle. The victims of racism know best how to fight back against it. So, what type of anti-racist group is needed? The black movement needs allies in its battle against the racist capitalist class. Not the usual liberal or phony radical support, but genuine revolutionary working class support and solidarity, otherwise called mutual aid by anarchists. The basis of such unity, however, must be principled and based on class interest, rather than liberal guilt-tripping or do-gooding or opportunism and manipulation by liberal or radical political parties. The needs of the oppressed people must be the most important consideration, but they want genuine support, not fakery or leftist rhetoric. The anarchist movement, which is overwhelmingly white, must start to understand that they need to do propaganda work among the black and other oppressed community, and they need to make it possible for non-white anarchists to organize in their communities by providing them with technical resources, the printing of zines, video and audio cassette production, etc., and assisting with financial resources. One reason there are so few black anarchists is because the movement provides no means to reach people of color, win them over to anarchism, and help them organize themselves. This must change if we want the social revolution to take place in America, and if we want North American anarchism to be more than a white rights movement. This type of organization must be a mass organization working to unite all workers in a common class struggle, but must be able to recognize the duty to support and adopt the special demands of the black and other non-white peoples as those of the entire working class. It must challenge white supremacy on a daily basis. It must refute racist philosophy and propaganda, and must counter racist mobilization and attacks with armed self-defense and street fighting when necessary. The objective of such a mass movement is to win the white working class over to an anti-white supremacy, class-conscious position, to unite the entire working class, and to directly confront and overthrow the capitalist state and its rulers. The cooperation of and solidarity of all workers is essential for full social revolution, not just its privileged white sector. For instance, an existing organization like Anti-Racist Action, if adopting such politics as an anarchist group, should be given a higher priority by our movement. Every city and town should have an ARA-type collectives, and every existing anarchist federation should have internal working groups that do work around racism and police brutality. In fact, the type of group that I am talking about would be a federation itself to coordinate struggles on the national and maybe even international level. This would be a revolutionary movement, not content to sit around and read books, elect a few black politicians or friends of labor to Congress or the state legislature, write protest letters, circulate petitions, or other such tame tactics. It would take the examples of the early radical labor movements like the IWW, as well as the civil rights movement of the 1960s, to show that only direct action tactics of confrontation and militant protest will yield any results at all. It would also have the example of the 1992 Los Angeles Rebellion to show that people will revolt, but there need to be powerful allies extending material aid and resistance info and an existing mass movement to take it to the next step and spread the insurrection. The anarchists must recognize this and help build a militant anti-racist group, which would be both a support group for the black revolution and a mass organizing center to unite the class.
It is very important to wrest the mass influence of the racial equality movement out of the hands of the left liberal democratic wing of the ruling class. The left liberals may talk a good fight, but as long as they are not for overthrowing capitalism and smashing the state, they will betray and sabotage the entire struggle against racism. The strategy of the left liberals is to deflect class consciousness into strictly race consciousness. They refuse to appeal on the basis of class material interests to the U.S. working and middle classes to support black rights, and as a result, allow the right wing to capitalize unopposed on the latent racist feeling among whites as well as their economic insecurity. This kind of movement I am proposing will step in the breach and attack white supremacy and dismantle the very threads of what holds capitalism together. Without the mass white consensus to the rule of the American state and the system of white skin privilege, capitalism could not go on into the next century. The Myth of Reverse Racism Reverse discrimination has become the war cry of all those races trying to roll back civil rights gains won by blacks and other oppressed nationalities in housing, education, employment, and every aspect of social life. The racists feel these things should only go to white males, and that minorities and women are taking them away from white men. Millions of white workers day in and day out are bombarded by this racist propaganda, and it is having a big impact. Many whites believe this lie of reverse discrimination against white people. This belief is embraced by many duped white workers who consider reverse discrimination to be at least partly responsible for the economic problems so many of them are suffering from today. Such beliefs propelled Ronald Reagan to his two terms as U.S. president. Reagan tried to use this racist propaganda line to precipitate a rollback in the civil rights gains of oppressed nationalities. The racists claim the concept of reverse discrimination suggests the wholesale discrimination against blacks and other racially oppressed groups is a hoax. Badly stated, the idea is that the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act ended discrimination against blacks, Latinos, and other nationalities, and women, and now the law is discriminating against white people. The racists say that racial minorities and women are now the new privileged groups in American society. They are allegedly getting the pick of jobs, preferential college placements, the best housing, government grants, and so on, at the expense of white workers. The racists say programs to end discrimination are not only necessary, but are actually attempts by minorities to gain power at the expense of white workers. They say blacks and women do not want equality, but rather hegemony over white workers. An anarchist, anti-racist movement would counter such propaganda and expose it as a ruling class weapon. The Civil Rights Act did not cause inflation by excessive spending on welfare, housing, or other social services. Further, blacks aren't discriminating against whites. Whites are not being herded into ghetto housing, removed from or prohibited from entering professions, deprived of decent education, forced into malnutrition and early death, subjected to racial violence and police repression, forced to suffer disproportionate levels of unemployment, and other forms of racial oppression. But for blacks, the oppression starts with birth and childhood. Infant mortality rate is nearly three times that of whites, and it continues uh, throughout their lives. The fact is, reverse discrimination is a hoax. Anti-black discrimination is not a thing of the past. It is the systematic, all-pervasive reality today. Malcolm X pointed out in the 1960s that no civil rights statutes would give black people their freedom, and asked if Africans in America were really citizens, why would civil rights be necessary? Malcolm X observed civil rights had been fought for at a great sacrifice and therefore should be enforced. But if the government won't enforce the laws, then the people will have to do so, and the movement will have to pressure the government authorities to protect democratic rights. To unite the masses of people behind a working class anti-racist movement, the following practical demands, which are a combination of revolutionary and radical reformism to ensure democratic rights, are necessary. 1. Black and white workers' solidarity. Fight racism on the job and in society. 2. Full democratic and human rights for all non-white peoples. Make unions fight racism and discrimination. 3. Armed self-defense against racist attacks. Build mass movement against racism and fascism. 4. Community control of the police. Replacement of cops by community self-defense force elected by residents. End police brutality. Prosecution of all killer cops. 5. Money for rebuilding the cities. Creation of public works brigades to rebuild inner city areas made up of community residents. 
sex, full socially useful employment at union wages for all workers, end racial discrimination in jobs, training, and promotions, establish affirmative action programs to reverse past racist employment practices. 7. Ban the Ku Klux Klan, Nazis, and other fascist organizations. Prosecution of all racists for attacks on people of color. 8. Free open admissions to all institutions of learning for those qualified to attend. No racial exclusion in higher education. 9. End taxes of workers and poor. Tax the rich and major corporations. 10. Full health and medical care for all persons and communities, regardless of race and class. 11. Free all political prisoners and innocent victims of racial injustice. Abolish prisons. Fight economic disparity. 12. Rank and file democratic control of the unions by building an anarcho-syndicalist labor movement. Make unions active in social issues. 13. Stop racist harassment and discrimination of undocumented workers. Smash the right wing. Fascism is not to be debated. It is to be smashed. Buenaventura Dritti, Spanish anarchist revolutionary, 1936. As capitalist society decays, people will look for radical and total solutions to the misery they face. The Nazis and the Klan are among the few right-wing political forces that offer, or appear to offer, a radical answer to the current problems of society for the white masses. That these solutions are false will matter little to confused and hysterical people searching desperately for a way out of the socio-economic crisis the capitalist world is facing. Sections of the middle class, better off layers of the white working class, poor and unemployed white workers, all poisoned by the racism of this society, are easy prey for Nazis and Klan demagogues. The Nazis, skinheads, and the Klan are the most extreme right-wing, ra racist, fascist organizations in the United States. Today these groups are small, and many liberals like to downplay the threat they represent, even to argue for their legal rights to spread their racist venom. But these groups have a tremendous growth potential and be could become a mass movement in surprisingly short periods of time, especially during e economic and political crisis like we are now in. Basing themselves on alienated white social forces, the Nazis and Klan are trying to build a mass movement that can hire itself out to the capitalists at the proper moment and assume state power. When the capitalists feel that they might need an additional club to keep the workers and the oppressed in line, they will turn to the Nazis, Klan, and similar right-wing organizations with both money and support, in addition to strengthening the state police and military forces. If need be, the capitalists will place them in power, as they did in Spain, Germany, and Italy in the 1920s and 1930s. So the fascists will smash the unions and other working-class organizations, place blacks, Latinos, gays, Asians, and Jews into concentration camps, and turn the rest of the workers into state slaves. Fascism is the ultimate authoritarian society when in power, even though it has changed its face to a mixture of crude racism and smoother racism in the modern democratic state. So in addition to the Nazis and the Klan, there are other right-wing forces that have been on the rise in the last 15 years. They include ultra-conservative rightists, politicians, and Christian fundamentalist preachers, along with the extreme right section of the capitalist ruling class itself. Small business owners, talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh, along with professors, economists, philosophers, and others in academia, providing the ideological weaponry for the capitalist offensive against the workers and oppressed people. Not all racists wear sheets. These are respectable racists, the new right conservatives who are far more dangerous than the Klan or Nazis because their politics have become acceptable to large masses of white workers, who in turn blame racial minorities for their problems. The capitalist class has already shown their willingness to use this conservative movement as a spokescreen for an attack on the labor movement. Black struggle and the entire working class Many city public workers have been fired. Schools, hospitals, and other social services have been curtailed. Government agencies have been privatized. Welfare roles have been cut drastically, and the budgets of city and state governments slashed. Banks have even used their dictatorial powers to demand these budget cuts, and to even make entire cities default if they did not submit. This even happened to New York in the 1970s. So this is not just an issue of poor, dumb rednecks in hoods. This is about hoods in business suits. 
A first step in organizing and preparing the working class in the economic crisis we face is to directly take on the right-wing threat. Repressive economic legislation by conservative politicians to punish the poor and working class must be defeated. Taxes on the rich and major corporations must be increased, while taxes on workers and farmers must be abolished. If the politicians will not do it, we will organize a tax boycott to force them to do it. The Nazis and Klan must be confronted through direct action. Anarchists, the left and labor organizations, must organize to defend workers and the oppressed from physical assaults by the racists, as well as hold mass demonstrations in the streets at fascist rallies. We must also oppose scum like Operation Rescue that uses violent fascist tactics against women's rights to abortions. It is part of the same battleground. Here is the situation. David Duke, the ex-Klansman, is now part of the respectable right, which picks up support among the upper middle class. Meanwhile, the Klan and Nazi skinheads are making headway among different social layers, mainly poor white workers and unemployed white youth. Tom Metzger, the leader of White Aryan Resistance, called the Nazi skinheads his brown shirts of the 90s. This is very dangerous, but we cannot leave these people to the Nazis and Klan uncontested. We should try to win them over, or at least neutralize any active opposition on their part. This is a defensive tactic at the very least, but we really have no choice, and it is part of our revolutionary duty to organize the entire working class anyway. We should direct propaganda to these workers to expose the Nazis and Klan for the scum they are, and show how the workers are being misled. We should also make it possible for them to fight this misery against the real enemy, the capitalist class. But in addition to defensive operations for propaganda, we must take direct offensive action to physically resist the racist when this is possible. For example, where the balance of forces allows it, we must organize to forcefully drive Nazis and Klan off the streets. In order to smash their movements, we must organize commando-type actions to attack their rallies, close their bookshops and newspapers, destroy their meeting halls, and break up their marches. Since the Nazi and Klan organize by threatening and using violence, we must be prepared to reply to them in kind, but in a better organized and more effective way. For instance, pigs like David Duke and Tom Metzger, who have been advocating and leading the fascist movement in America, should be assassinated. We should infiltrate Klan and Nazi demonstrations in order to assault black leaders and disrupt them, or hide at a distance and snipe them with high-powered rifles. I have always felt that underground guerrilla movements like the Black Liberation Army, Weather Underground, and New World Liberation Front should have attacked fascist movements and assassinated their leaders. If we cripple the fascists in this fashion, we can smash the entire right wing and begin to smash the state. This is the only way to stop fascists. Death to the Klan and all fascists. None other than Adolf Hitler has been quoted as saying, only one thing could have stopped our movement. If our adversaries had understood its principle, and from the first day had smashed with the utmost brutality the nucleus of our new movement, we should take heed. One other thing that we must do, and is something which tactically separates us anarchists from the Marxist-Leninists, is that we use our studies of the authoritarian personality to help us organize against fascist recruitment. All the MLs United Fronts care about is a strict political approach to defeat fascism and prevent them from attaining state power, while being able to usher the Communist Party instead. They organize liberals and others into mass coalitions just to seize power and then crush all radical and liberal ideological opponents after they get done with the fascists. That is why the Stalinist communist states resemble fascist police states so much in refusing to allow ideological plurality. They are both totalitarian. For that matter, how much difference was there really between Stalin and Hitler? So I say that merely physically beating back the fascists is not the issue. We need to study what accounts for the mass psychology of fascism and then defeat it ideologically, going to the core of the deep-seated racist beliefs, emotions, and authoritarian conditioning of those workers who support fascism and all police state authority. The third prong of our strategy is to organize among the workers and other oppressed sections of society with a program that addresses their needs. As has been said, the Klan and Nazis recruit among certain social layers, overwhelmingly white youth who are hard-pressed by the economic crisis. These people see blacks, Latinos, Asians, gays, women, and radical movements as a threat. They are racist, reactionary, and potentially very violent. 
Fearful that they will lose what little they have, they buy the myth that the problems is those people trying to steal their jobs, homes, future, etc., rather than the decay of the capitalist system. As long as there appears to be no alternative to fighting over a shrinking social pie, the fascists, with their simple-minded solutions, will get a hearing among the degenerate elements of the working class. The only way to undercut the appeal of the right is to organize a libertarian workers' movement that can fight for and win the things that people need. Jobs, decent housing, and schools, health care, etc. This can demonstrate concretely that there is an alternative to the right wing's poisonous solutions, and it can win the, to the ranks of the workers' movement some of those people attracted to the fascist movement. In all areas of our organizing, we must carry out consistent revolutionary propaganda explaining capitalism is responsible for unemployment, rising prices, rotten schools and housing, and the rest of the decay we see around us. We must expose the fact that while the Nazis, Klan, and other right-wingers make g blacks, gays, Latinos, and other oppressed people the scapegoat for the economic crisis, their real aim is to destroy the entire workers' movement, commit genocide, start an adventuristic war, and turn workers into outright slaves of the state. Therefore, these fascist forces are a threat to all workers of every nationality. It must be explained that they only want to use white workers as pawns in their scheme to create a fascist dictatorship, and all workers must unite and fight back and overthrow the state if they are to be free. Death to the Klan. Death to the Nazis. Defeat White Supremacy The very means of class control by the rich is the least understood. White supremacy is more than just a set of ideas or prejudices. It is national oppression, yet to most white people the term conjures up images of the Nazis or Ku Klux Klan rather than the system of white skin privileges that really undergirds the capitalist system in the U.S. Most people, anarchists included, believe in essence that black people are the same as whites and that we should just fight around common issues rather than deal with racial matters if they see any urgency in dealing with the matter at all. Some will not raise it in such a blunt fashion. They will say that class issues should take precedence, but it means the same thing. They believe it's possible to put off the struggle against white supremacy until after the revolution, when in fact there will be no revolution if white supremacy is not attacked and defeated first. They won't win a revolution in the U.S. until they fight to improve the lot of blacks and oppressed peoples who are being deprived of their democratic rights as well as being super exploited as workers. Almost from the very inception of the North American socialist movement, the simple-minded economist position that all black and white workers have to do to wage a revolution is to engage in a common economic struggle has been used to avoid struggle against white supremacy. In fact, the white left has always taken the chauvinist position that since the white working class is the revolutionary vanguard anyway, why worry about an issue that will divide the class? Historically, anarchists have not even brought up the matter of race politics, as one anarchist referred to it in the first time this pamphlet was published. This is a total evasion of the issue. Yet, it is the capitalist bourgeoisie that creates inequality as a way to divide and rule over the entire working class. White skin privilege is a form of domination by the capital over white labor as well as oppressed nationality labor, not just providing material incentives to buy off white workers and set them against black and other oppressed workers. This explains the obedience of white labor to capitalism and the state. The white working class does not see their better off condition as part of the system of exploitation. After centuries of political and social indoctrination, they feel their privileged position is just and proper, and what is more has been earned. They feel threatened by social gains of non-white workers, which is why they so vehemently oppose affirmative action plans to benefit minorities in jobs and hiring, and to redress years of discrimination against them. It is also why white workers have opposed most civil rights legislation. Yet it is the day-to-day -day workings of white supremacy that we must fight most vigorously. We cannot remain ignorant or indifferent to the workings of race and class under this system, so that oppressed workers remain victimized. For years, blacks have been first hired, first fired by capitalist industry. Further, seniority systems have engaged in open racial discrimination and are little more than white job trusts. Blacks have even been driven out of whole industries, such as coal mining. 
Yet the white labor bosses have never objected or intervened on behalf of their class brothers, nor will they if not pressed up against the wall by white workers. As pointed out, there are material incentives to this white worker opportunism. Better jobs, higher pay, improved living conditions in white communities, etc. In short, what has come to be known as the white middle class lifestyle. This is what labor and the left have always fought to maintain, not class solidarity, which would necessitate a struggle against white supremacy. This lifestyle is based on the super-exploitation of the non-white sector of the domestic working class, as well as countries exploited by imperialism around the world. In America, class antagonism has always included racial hatred as an essential component, but it is structural rather than ideological. Since all of the institutions, the culture, and the socioeconomic system of the U.S. capitalism are based on white supremacy, how then is it possible to truly fight the rule of capital without being forced to defeat white supremacy? The dual-tier economy of whites on top and blacks on the bottom, even with all the class differences among whites, has successfully resisted every attempt by radical social movements. These reluctant reformers have danced around the issue. While winning reforms, in many cases primarily for white workers only, these white radicals have yet to topple the system and open the road to social revolution. The fight against white skin privilege also requires the rejection of the vicious identification of North Americans as white people rather than as Welsh, German, Irish, etc. as their national origin. This white race designation is a contrived supranationality designed to inflate the social importance of European ethnics and to enlist them as tools in the capitalist system of exploitation. In North America, white skin has always implied freedom and privilege, freedom to gain employment, to travel, to obtain social mobility out of one's born class standing, and a whole world of Eurocentric privileges. Therefore, before a social revolution can take place, there must be an abolition of the social category of the white race. With few exceptions in this essay, I will begin referring to them as North Americans. These white people must engage in class suicide and race treachery before they can be truly accepted as allies of black and nationally oppressed workers. The whole idea behind a white race is conformity and making them accomplices to mass murder and exploitation. If white people do not want to be saddled with the historical le legacy of colonialism, slavery, and genocide themselves, then they must rebel against it. So the whites must denounce the white identity and its system of privilege, and they must struggle to redefine themselves and their relationship with others. As long as white society, through the state, which says it is acting in the name of white people, continues to oppress and dominate all the institutions of the black community, racial tension will continue to exist, and whites generally will continue to be seen as the enemy. So what do North Americans start to do to defeat ra racial opportunism, white skin privileges, and other forms of white supremacy? First, they must break down the walls separating them from their non-white allies. Then together, they must wage a fight against inequality in the workplace, communities, and in the social order. Yet it not just the democratic rights of the African people we are referring to when we are talking about national oppression. If that were the whole issue, then maybe more reforms could obtain racial and social equality. But no, that is not what we are talking about. Blacks or Africans in America are colonized. America is a mother country with an internal colony. For Africans in America, our situation is one of total oppression. No people are truly free until they can determine their own destiny. Ours is a captive, oppressed colonial status that must be overthrown, not just smashing ideological racism or denial of civil rights. In fact, without smashing the internal colony first means the likelihood of a continuance of this oppression in another form. We must destroy the social dynamic of a very real existence of America being made up of an oppressor white nation and an oppressed black nation. In fact, there are several captive nations. This requires the black liberation movement to liberate a colony, and this is why it is not just a simple matter of blacks just joining with white anarchists to fight the same type of battle against the state. That is also why anarchists cannot take a rigid position against all forms of black nationalism, especially revolutionary groups like the Black Panther Party, even if there are ideological differences about the way some of them are formed and operate. But North Americans must support the objectives of racially oppressed liberation movements, and they must directly challenge and reject white skin privilege. There is no other way, and there isn't a shortcut. White supremacy is a huge stumbling block to revolutionary social change in North America.
The Black Revolution and other national liberation movements in North America are indispensable parts of the overall social revolution. North American workers must join with Africans, Latinos, and others to reject racial injustice, capitalist exploitation, and national oppression. North American workers certainly have an important role in helping those struggles to triumph. Material aid alone, which can be assembled by white workers for the black revolution, could dictate the victory or defeat of that struggle in a particular stage. I am taking time to explain all this, because predictably, some anarchist purists will try to argue me down that having a white movement is a good thing, that blacks and other oppressed nationalities just need to climb aboard the anarchist good ship. A ship of fools? And all of this is just Marxist national liberation nonsense. Well, we know part of the reason for an anarchist anti-racist movement is to challenge this chauvinist perspective right in the middle of our own movement. An anarchist anti-racist federation would not exist just to fight Nazis. We need to challenge and correct racist and doctrinaire positions on race and class within our movement. If we cannot do that, then we cannot organize the working class, black or white, and are of no use to anyone. Chapter 2 where is the black struggle and where should it be going? Some, usually comfortable black middle class professionals, politicians, or businessmen who rode the 1960s civil rights movement into power or prominence, will say there is no longer any necessity to struggle in the streets during the 1990s for black freedom. They say we have arrived and are now almost free. They say our struggle now is to integrate the money or win wealth for themselves and members of their social class, even though they give lip service to empowering the poor. Look, they say, we can vote. Our black faces are all over TV and commercials and situation comedies. There are hundreds of black millionaires, and we have political representatives in the halls of Congress and state houses all over the land. In fact, they say there are currently over 7,000 black elected officials, several of whom preside over the largest cities in the nation, and there is even a governor of a southern state who is African American. That's what they say. But does this tell the whole story? The fact is, we are in as bad or even worse shape economically and politically as when the civil rights movement began in the 1950s. One in every four black males are in prison, on probation, parole, or under arrest. At least one-third or more of black family units are now single-parent families, mired in poverty. Unemployment hovers at 18-25% to 25 for black communities. The drug economy is the number one employer of black youth. Most substandard housing units are still concentrated in black neighborhoods. Blacks and other non-whites suffer from the worst health care, and black communities are still underdeveloped because of racial discrimination by municipal governments, mortgage companies, and banks who redline black neighborhoods from receiving community development, housing, and small business loans which keep our communities poor. We also suffer from murderous acts of police brutality by racist cops, which has resulted in thousands of deaths and wounding, and internecine gang warfare resulting in numerous youth homicides and a great deal of grief. But what we suffer from most and what encompasses all these ills is the fact that we are an oppressed people. In fact, a colonized people subject to the rule of an oppressive government. We really have no rights under this system, except that which we have fought for, and even that is now in peril. Clearly, we need a new mass black protest movement to challenge the government and corporations and expropriate the funds needed for our communities to survive. Yet, for the past 25 years, the revolutionary black movement has been on the defensive. Due to co-optation, repression, and betrayals of the black liberation movement of the 1960s, today's movement has suffered a series of setbacks and has now become static in comparison. This may be because it is just now getting its stuff together after being pummeled by the state's police agencies, and also because of the internal political contradictions which arose in major black revolutionary groups like the Black Panther Party, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Community, SNCC, or SNCC as it was called in those days, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. I believe all were factors that led to the destruction of the 1960s black left in this country. Of course, many blame this period of relative inactivity in the black movement on the lack of forceful leaders in the mold of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, etc., while others, people, blame the fact that black masses have allegedly become corrupt and apathetic or just need the correct revolutionary line. 
Whatever the true facts of the matter, it can be clearly seen that the government, the capitalist corporations, and the racist ruling class are exploiting the current weakness and confusion of the black movement to make an attack on the black working class and are attempting to totally strip the gains won during the civil rights era. In addition, there is a resurgence of racism and conservatism among broad layers of the white population, which is a direct result of this right-wing campaign. Clearly, this is a time when we must entertain new ideas and new tactics in the freedom struggle. The ideals of anarchism are something new to the black movement and have never really been examined by black or other non-white activists. Put simply, it means the people themselves should rule, not governments, political parties, or self-appointed leaders in their name. Anarchism also stands for the self-determination of all oppressed peoples and their right to struggle for freedom by any means necessary. So what road is in order for the black movement? Continue to depend on opportunistic democratic hack politicians like Bill Clinton or Ted Kennedy? The same old group of middle class sellout leaders of the civil rights lobby? One or another of the authoritarian Leninist sects who insist that they and they alone have the correct path to revolutionary enlightenment? Or finally building a grassroots revolutionary protest movement to fight the racist government and rulers? Only the black masses can finally decide the matter, whether they will be content to bear the brunt of the current economic depression and the escalating racist brutality, or will lead a fight back. Anarchists trust the best instincts of the people, and human nature dictates that where there is repression, there will be resistance. Where there is slavery, there will be a struggle against it. The black masses have shown they will fight, and when they organize, they will win. A call for a new black protest movement. Those anarchists who are black like myself recognize there has to be a whole new social movement which is democratic on the grassroots level and is self-activated. It will be a movement independent of the major political parties, the state, and the government. It must be a movement that although it seeks to expropriate government money for projects that benefit the people, it does not recognize any progressive role for the government in the lives of the people. The government will not free us, and is part of the problem rather than part of the solution. In fact, only the black masses themselves can wage the black freedom struggle, not a government bureaucracy, like the U.S. Justice Department, reformist civil rights leaders like Jesse Jackson, or a revolutionary vanguard party on their behalf. Of course, at a certain historical moment, a protest leader can play a tremendous revolutionary role as a spokesperson for the people's feelings, or even produce a correct strategy and theory for a certain period. Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, and Martin Luther King Jr. come to mind, and a vanguard party may win mass support and acceptance among the people for a time, e.g. the Black Panther Party of the 1960s. But it is the black masses themselves who will make the revolution, and once set spontaneously in motion, know exactly what they want. Though leaders may be motivated by good and bad, even they will act as a break on the struggle, especially if they lose touch with the freedom aspirations of the black masses. Leaders can only really serve a legitimate purpose as an advisor and catalyst to the movement and should be subject to immediate recall if they act contrary to the people's wishes. In that kind of limited role, they are not leaders at all. They are community organizers. The dependence of the black movement on leaders and leadership, especially the black bourgeoisie, has led us into a political dead end. We are expected to wait and suffer silently until the next messianic leader asserts himself, as if he or she were divinely missioned, as some have claimed to be. What is even more harmful is that many black people have adopted a slavish psychology of obeying and serving our leaders without considering what they themselves are capable of doing. Thus, rather than trying to analyze the current situation and carrying on Brother Malcolm X's work in the community, they prefer to bemoan the brutal facts for year after year of how he was taken away from us. Some mistakenly refer to this as a leadership vacuum. The fact is, there has not been much movement in the black revolutionary movement since his assassination, and the virtual destruction of groups like the Black Panther Party. We have been stagnated by middle-class reformism and misunderstanding. We need to come up with new ideas and revolutionary formations in how to fight our enemies. We need a new mass protest movement. It is up to the black masses to build it, not leaders or political parties. They cannot save us. We can only save ourselves. What form will this movement take? 
If there was one thing learned by anarchist revolutionary organizers in the 1960s, you don't organize a mass movement or a social revolution just by creating one central organization, such as a vanguard political party or a labor union. Even though anarchists believe in revolutionary organization, it is a means to an end, instead of the ends itself. In other words, the anarchist groups are not formed with the intention of being permanent organizations to seize power after a revolutionary struggle, but rather to be groups which act as a catalyst to revolutionary struggles and which try to take the people's rebellions, like the 1992 Los Angeles revolt, to a higher level of resistance. Two features of a new mass movement must be the intention of creating dual power institutions to challenge the state, along with the ability to have a grassroots autonomous movement that can take advantage of a pre-revolutionary situation to go all the way. Dual power means that you organize a number of collectives and communes in cities and town all over North America, which are in fact liberated zones, outside of the control of government. Autonomy means that the movement must be truly independent and a free association of all those united around common goals, rather than membership as the result of some oath or other pressure. So how would anarchists intervene in the revolutionary process in black neighborhoods? Well, obviously, North American or white anarchists cannot go into black communities and just proselytize, but they certainly should work with any non-white anarchists and help them work in communities of color. I do think that the example of the New Jersey Anarchist Federation and its loose alliance with the Black Panther movement in that state is an example of how we must start. And we are definitely not talking about a situation where black organizers go into the neighborhood and win people to anarchism so that they can then be controlled by whites in some party. This is how the Communist Party and other Marxist groups operate, but it cannot be how anarchists work. We spread anarchists' belief not to take over people, but to let them know how they can better organize themselves to fight tyranny and obtain freedom. We want to work with them as fellow human beings and allies who have their own experiences, agendas, and needs. The idea is to get as many movements of people fighting the state as possible, since that is what brings the day of freedom for us all a little closer. There needs to be some sort of revolutionary organization for anarchists to work on the local level, so we will call these local groups Black Resistance Committees. Each one of these committees will be black working class social revolutionary collectives in the community to fight for black rights and freedom as part of the social revolution. The committees would have no leader or party boss and would be without any type of hierarchy structure. It would also be anti-authority. They exist to do revolutionary work, which will be linked with other such groups all over North America and other parts of the world in a larger movement called a federation. A federation is needed to coordinate the actions of such groups, to let others know what is happening in each area, and to set down widespread strategy and tactics. We will call this one, for want of a better name, the African Revolutionary Federation, or it can be part of a multicultural federation. A federation of the sort I am talking about is a mass membership organization which will be democratic and made up of all kinds of smaller groups and individuals, but this is not a government or a representative system I am talking about. There would be no permanent positions of power, and even the facilitators of internal programs would be subject to immediate recall or have regular rotation of duties. When a federation is no longer needed, it can be disbanded. Try that with a communist party, or one of the major capitalist parties in North America. Revolutionary Strategy and Tactics If we are to build a new black revolutionary protest movement, we must ask ourselves how we can hurt this capitalist system, and how have we hurt it in the past when we have led social movements against some aspect of our oppression. Boycotts, mass demonstrations, rent strikes, picketing, work strikes, sit-ins, and other such protests have been used by the black movement at different times in its history, along with armed self-defense and open rebellion. Put simply, what we need to do is take our struggle to a new and higher level. We need to take these tried and true tactics, which have been used primarily on the local level up to this point, and utilize them on a national level, and then couple them with as yet untried tactics for a strategic attack on the major capitalist corporations and governmental apparatus. We shall discuss a few of them. A Black Tax Boycott Black people should refuse to pay any taxes to the racist government, including federal income, estate, and state's taxes, while being subjected to the exploitation and brutality. The rich and their corporations pay virtually no taxes. It is the poor and workers who bear the brunt of taxation, yet they receive nothing in return. There are still huge unemployment levels in the black community, and the unemployment and welfare benefits are paltry. 
The schools are dilapidated, public housing is a disgrace, while rents by absentee landlord properties are exorbitant. All these conditions and more supposedly corrected by government taxation of income, goods, and services. Wrong. It goes to the Pentagon, defense contractors and greedy consultants who, like vultures, prey on business with government. The Black Liberation Movement should establish a mass tax resistance movement to lead a black tax boycott as a means of protest and also a method to create a fund to finance black community projects and organizations. Why should we continue to voluntarily support our own slavery? A black tax boycott is just another means of struggle that the black movement should examine and adopt, which is similar to the peace movement's war tax resistance. Blacks should be exempted from all taxation on personal property, income, taxes, stocks, and bonds, the latter of which would be a new type of community development issuance. Tax the Rich National Rent Strike and Urban Squatting Hand in glove with a tax boycott should be a refusal to pay rent for dilapidated housing. These rent boycotts have been used to great effect to fight back against rent gouging by landlords. At one time, they were so effective in Harlem, New York City, that they caused the creation of rent control legislation, preventing evictions, unjustified price increases, and requiring reasonable upkeep by the owners and the property management company. A mass movement could bring a rent strike to areas, such as in the southwest and southeast, where poor people are being ripped off by greedy landlords, but are not familiar with such tactics. Unfair laws, now in the books, so-called landlord-tenant, where the only right the tenant have is to pay the rent or be evicted, should also be liberalized and overturned entirely. These laws only help slumlords stay in business and keep exploiting the poor and working class. They account for mass evictions, which in turn account for homelessness. We should fight to roll back rents, prevent mass evictions, and house the poor and homeless in decent, affordable places. Besides the refusal to pay the slumlords and exploitative banks and property management companies, there should be a campaign of urban squatting to just take over the housing and have the tenants run it democratically as a housing collective. Then that money, which would have gone towards rent, could now go into repairing the dwelling of the tenants. The homeless, poor persons needing affordable housing, and others who badly need housing should just take over any abandoned housing owned by an absentee landlord or even a boarded-up city housing project. Squatting is an especially good tactic in these times of serious housing shortages and arson for insurance by the slumlords. We should throw the bums out and just take over. Of course, we will probably have to fight the cops and crooked landlords who will try to use strong-arm tactics, but we can do that too. We can win significant victories if we organize a nationwide series of rent strikes and build an independent tenants movement that will self-manage all the facilities, not on behalf of the government with the tricky Kemp plan, but on behalf of themselves. A Boycott of American Business It was proven that one of the strangest weapons of the civil rights movement was a black consumer boycott of a community's merchants and public services. Merchants and other businessmen, of course, are the leading citizens of any community and the local ruling class and boss of the government. In the 1960s, when blacks refused to trade with merchants as long as they allowed racial discrimination, their loss of revenue drove them to make concessions and mediate the struggle, even holding the cops and clan at bay. What is true at the local level is certainly true at the national level. The major corporations and elite families run the country. The government is its mere tool. Blacks spend over $350 billion a year in this capitalist economy as consumers and could just as easily wage economic warfare against the corporate structure with a well-planned boycott to win political concessions. For instance, a corporation like General Motors is heavily dependent upon black consumers, which means that it is very vulnerable to a boycott. If one were organized and supported wildly, if blacks would refuse to buy General Motors cars, it would result in significant losses for the corporation, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Something like this could even bring a company to its knees. Yet the revolutionary wing of the black movement has yet to use boycotts, calling it reformism and outdated. But far from being an outdated tacti tactic that we should abandon, boycotts have become more effective in the last few years. In 1988, the black and progressive movement in the United States hit on another tactic, boycotting the tourist industries of whole cities and states which engaged in discrimination. 
This reflected, on the one hand, how many cities have gone from smokestack industries in the 1960s to tourism as their major source of revenue, and on the other hand, a recognition by the movement that economic warfare was a potent weapon against discriminatory governments. The 1990-1993 black boycott against the Miami, Florida tourism industry and the current gay rights boycott against the state of Colorado, started in 1992, have been both successful and have gotten worldwide attention to the problems in their communities. In fact, boycotts have been expanded to cover everything from California grapes, beers, from Coors, a certain brand of jeans, all products made in the country of South Africa, a certain meat industry, and many things in between. Boycotts are more popular today than they have ever been. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized the potential revolutionary power of a national black boycott of America's major corporations, which is why he established Operation Breadbasket shortly before an assassin killed him. This organization with offices in Chicago was designed to be the conduit for the funds that the corporations were going to be forced to pour money into for a national black community development project for poor communities. And although he was assassinated before this can happen, we must continue his work in this manner. All over the country, black boycott offices should be opened. We should build it into a mass movement involving all sectors of our people. We should demonstrate, picket, and sit in at meetings and offices of target corporations all over the country. We must take it to their very doorstep and stop their looting of the black community. A Black General Strike because of the role they play in production, black workers are potentially the most powerful sector of the black community for, in the struggle for black freedom. The vast majority of the black community is working class people. Barring the disproportionate numbers of unemployed, about 11 million black men and women are today part of the workforce of the United States. About 5 to 6 million of these are in basic industries such as steel and metal fabrication, retail trades, food production and processing, meat packing, the automobile industry, railroading, medical service and communications. Blacks number one-third to one-half of the basic blue-collar workers and one-third of clerical laborers. Black labor is therefore very important to the capitalist economy. Because of this vulnerability to job actions by black workers, who are some of the most militant workers on the job, they could take a leading role in a protest campaign against racism and class oppression. If they are properly organized, they would be a class vanguard within our movement, since they are at the point of production. Black workers could lead a nationwide general strike at their place of work as a protest against racial discrimination in jobs and housing. The inordinately high levels of black unemployment and brutal working conditions and to further the, the demands of the black movement generally. This general strike is a socialist strike, not just a strike for higher wages and over general working conditions. It is revolutionary in politics using other means. This general strike can take the form of industrial sabotage, factory occupations or sit-ins, work slowdowns, wildcats, and other work stoppages as a protest to gain concessions on the local and national level and restructure the workplace and wind the four-hour day for North American labor. The strike would not only involve workers on the job, but also the black community and progressive groups to give support with picket line duty, leafleting, and publishing strike support newsletters, demonstrations at company offices and work sites, along with other activities. It will take some serious community and workplace organizing to bring a general strike off. In workplaces all over the country, black workers should organize general strike committees at the workplaces and black strike support committees to carry on the strike work inside the black community itself. Because such a strike would be especially hard fought and vicious, black workers should organize workers defense committees to defend workers fired or blacklisted by the bosses for their industrial organizing work. This defense committee would publicize a victimized workers case and rally support from other workers in the community. The Defense Committee would also establish a labor strike and defense fund and also start food cooperatives to financially and materially support such victimized workers and their families while carrying on the strike. Although there will definitely be an attempt to involve women and white workers where they are willing to cooperate, the strike would be under black leadership because only black workers can effectively raise those issues which most affect them. White workers have to support the democratic rights of blacks and other nationally oppressed laborers instead of just white rights campaigns and so-called common economic issues led by the North American left.
In addition to progressive North American individuals or union caucuses, the labor union locals themselves should be recruited, but they are not the force to lead this struggle, although their help can be indispensable in a particular campaign. It takes major, major organizing to make them break free of their racist and conservative nature. So although we want and need the support of our fellow workers of other nationalities and genders, it is ridiculous and condescending to just tell black workers to sit around and wait for a white workers vanguard to decide it wants to fight. We will educate our fellow workers to the issues and why they should fight white supremacy at our side, but we will not defer our struggle for anyone. We must organize the general strike for black freedom. The Commune Community Control of the Black Community How do we raise a new revolutionary consciousness against the system programmed against our old methods? We must use a new approach and revolutionize the black central city commune and slowly provide the people with the incentive to fight by allowing them to create programs which will meet all their social, political, and economic needs. We must fill the vacuums left by the established order. In return, we must teach them the benefits of our revolutionary ideals. We must build a subsistence economy and socio-political infrastructure so that we can become an example for all revolutionary people. George Jackson, in his book, B. The idea behind a mass commune is to create a dual power structure as a counter to the government, under conditions which exist now. In fact, anarchists believe the first step towards self-determination and the social revolution is black control of the black community. This means that black people must form and unify their own organizations of struggle, take control of the existing black communities and all institutions within them, and conduct a consistent fight to overcome every form of economic, political, and cultural servitude, and any system of racial and class inequality which is the product of this racist capitalist society. The realization of this aim means that we can build inner city communes, which will be centers of black counter power and social revolutionary culture against the white political power structures in the principal cities of the United States. Once they assume hegemony, such communes would be an actual alternative to the state and serve as a force to revolutionize African people and, by extension, large segments of American society, which could not possibly remain immune to this process. It would serve a, as a living revolutionary example to North American progressives and other oppressed nationalities. There is tremendous fighting power in the black community, but it is not organized in a structured revolutionary way to effectively struggle and take what is due. The white capitalist ruling class recognizes this, which is why it pushes the fraud of black capitalism and black politicians and other such responsible leaders. These fakes and sellout artists lead us to the dead-end road of voting and praying for that which we must be really willing to fight for. The anarchist recognizes the commune as the primary organ of the new society and as an alternative to the old society. But the anarchists also recognize that capitalism will not give up without a fight. It will be necessary to economically and politically cripple capitalist America. One thing for sure, we should not continue to passively allow this system to exploit and oppress us. The commune is a staging ground for black revolutionary struggle. For instance, black people should refuse to pay taxes to the racist government, should boycott the capitalist corporations, should lead a black general strike all over the country, and should engage in an insurrection to drive the police out and win a liberated zone. This would be a powerful method to obtain submission to the demands of the movement and weaken the power of the state. We can even force the government to make money available for community development as a concession instead of as a payoff to buy out the struggle as happened in the early 60s and thereafter. If we put a gun to a banker's head and said, we know you've got the money, now give it up, he would have to surrender. Now the question is, if we did the same thing to the government, using direct action means with insurrectionary mass movement, would these both be acts of expropriation? Or is it just to pacify the community why they gave us the money? One thing for sure, we definitely need the money, and however we compel it from the government is, less, is of less importance than the fact that we forced them to give it up to the people's forces at all. We would then use that money to rebuild our communities, maintain our organizations, and care for the needs of our people. It could be a major concession, a victory. But we have also got to realize that Africans in America are not simply oppressed by force of arms, but that part of the moral authority of the state comes from the mind of the oppressed that consent to the right to be governed. 
As long as black people believe that there is some moral or political authority of white government has legitimacy in their lives, that they owe a duty to this nation as citizens, or even that they are responsible for their own oppression, then they cannot effectively fight back. They must free their minds of the ideas of American patriotism and begin to see themselves as a new people. This can only be accomplished under dual power, where the patriotism of the people for the state is replaced with love and support for the new black commune. We do that by making the commune a real thing in the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary people. We should establish community councils to make policy decisions and administer the affairs of the black community. These councils would be democratic neighborhood assemblies, composed of representatives elected by black workers in various community institutions, factories, hospitals, schools, as well as delegates elected on a block basis. We must reject black mayors and other politicians or government bureaucrats as a substitute for community power. We must therefore have community control of all the institutions of the black community, instead of just letting the state decide what is good for us. Not just jobs and housing, but also full control over schools, hospitals, welfare centers, libraries, etc. must be turned over to that community, because only the residents of a community have a true understanding of its needs and desires. Here's an example of how it would work. We would elect a community council to supervise all schools in the black community. We would encourage parents, teachers, and students, and the community at large to work cooperatively in every phase of school administration, rather than have an authority figure like a principal and his or her uncaring bureaucratic administration run things as are done at present. The whole black community will have to engage in a militant struggle to take over the public schools and turn them into centers of black culture and learning. We cannot continue to depend on the racist or black puppet school boards to do this for us. The local council would then be federated, or joined together on a local level to create a citywide group of councils who would run affairs in that community. The councils and other neighborhoods collectives organized for a variety of reasons would make a mass commune. This commune it would be in turn federated at the regional and national level, the aim being to create a national federation of black communes, which would meet periodically in one or a number of mass assembly meetings. This federation would be composed of elected or appointed delegates representing their local commune or a council. Such a national uh, federation of communes would allow community councils from all over North America to work out common policies and speak with one voice on all matters affecting their communities or regions. It would thus have far more power than any single community council could. However, to prevent this national federation from bureaucratic usurpation of power by political factions or opportunistic leaders, elections should be held regularly and delegates would be subject to recall at any time for misconduct so that they remain under the control of the local communities they represent. The black community councils are really a type of grassroots movement made up of all the social formations of our people, the block and neighborhood committees, labor, student and youth groups, even the church to a limited degree, social activist groups and others to unite the various protest actions around a common program of struggle for this period. The campaigns for this period must utilize the tactics of direct mass action, as it is very important that the people themselves realize a sense of their organized power. These grassroots associations will provide to the usually mass spontaneous actions a form of organization whose social base is of the black working class, instead of the usual black middle class misleadership. Anarchists recognize these community councils as being a form of direct de democracy instead of the type of phony American democracy which is really nothing but control by politicians and businessmen. The councils are especially important because they provide embryonic self-rule and the beginnings of an alternative to the capitalist economic system and its government. It is a way to undermine the government and make it an irrelevant dinosaur because its services are no longer needed. The commune is also a black revolutionary counterculture. It is the embryo of the new black revolutionary society and the body of the old, sick, dying one. It is the new lifestyle in microcosm, which contains the new black social values and the new communal organizations and institutions, which will become the socio-political structure of free society. Our objective is to teach new black social values of unity and struggle against the negative effects of white capitalist society and culture. To do that, we must build the commune into a black consciousness movement to build race pride and respect, race and social awareness, and to struggle against capitalist slave masters. This black communalism would be both a repository of black culture and ideology. 
we need to change both our lives and our lifestyles in order to deal with many of the uh, interpersonal contradictions that exist within our community. We could examine the black family, black male to female relationships, the mental health of the black community, relations between the community and the white establishment, and among black people themselves. We would hold black consciousness, raising sessions in schools, community centers, prisons, and in black communities all over North America, which would teach black history and culture, new liberating social ideas and values to children and adults, as well as counseling and therapy techniques to resolve family and marital problems, all the while giving a black revolutionary perspective to the issues of the day. Our people must be made to see that the self-hatred, disunity, distrust, and internecine violence and oppressive social conditions among black people are the result of the legacy of African slavery and the present-day effects of capitalism. Finally, the main objective of black revolutionary culture is to agitate and organize black people to struggle for their freedom. As Steve Biko, the murdered South African revolutionary, has been quoted as saying, the call for black consciousness is the most positive call to come from an allied group in the black world for a long time. It is more than just a reactionary rejection of whites by blacks. At the heart of this kind of thinking is the realization by blacks that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Once the latter has been so effectively manipulated and controlled by the oppressor as to make the oppressed believe that he is a liability to the white man, then there is nothing the oppressed can do that will really scare the powerful masters. The philosophy of black consciousness therefore expresses group pride and the determination by blacks to rise up and attain the envisaged self. By the envisaged self, Biko refers to the black self, a liberated psyche. It is that which we want to rescue with such a black consciousness movement here in America. We need to counter black self-hatred and the frivolous party mentality. We also want to end the social deg degradation of our community and rid it of drug addiction, prostitution, black-on-black -black crime, and other social evils that destroys the moral fiber of the black community. Drugs and prostitution are mainly controlled by organized crime and protected by the police, who accept bribes and gifts from gangsters. These negative social values, the so-called dog-eat-dog philosophy of the capitalist system, teaches people to be individuals of the worst sort, willing to commit any kinds of crime against each other and to take advantage of each other. This oppressive culture is what we are fighting. As long as it exists, it will be hard to unify people around a revolutionary political program. 